welcome this monthly meeting, the afternoon session. There's something very personal I want to talk to you about. Great master, name was Savan Singh. We called him Hazur Maharaj Baba Savan Singh Ji, out of respect. Anytime I see his name anywhere, something happens to me. I don't know what kind of association this is, what kind of influence he had on me, what kind of power he had. And even if I hear his name or see it by accident, sometimes written on a billboard somewhere, something happens. As if the whole association I've had with him opens up, like one sharp memory of such beautiful times that I've had with him. So today, a little while ago, I got this book with his name on it. And it said, Memories of Saul. If the memories were not written, it would still be the same thing for me. I opened it up to see what it is. I found it has stories about my master. The same stories that I read earlier on my phone. They had been sent to me by uh, this gentleman who's sitting in front, Peter the Great. He's great. Ever since he sent me the stories, he's become even greater. <laughs> so when I read those stories, I normally in my life don't have tears in my eyes, but each story brought tears into my eyes. They brought the whole image because those are stories in which I actually personally saw great master at work. I saw his beauty, his compassion, his love, his way of dealing with people, his way of showing his affection, his way of solving their problems, his way of identifying with their problems. So amazing. I find that those stories are from this book. So I said, this is a good time I should tell you about this book because these stories have been compiled by, as the name says, B.B. Lajo. Great master had three young girls attending on him when he assumed the role of a master in the Dera at Bias and took over from his master, Baba Jamal Singh. My master was a very clever guy, I must tell you. He was so clever that before he took on the responsibility to carry on the work which Baba Jamal Singh was doing earlier at the same place, he put a lot of conditions. Now, I would not normally imagine a disciple who is asked to do something to say, I'll do it, but here, wait, here are my conditions. But he did lay down conditions. There were 14 people present when Baba Jamal Singh told Baba Savan Singh, you will carry on my work from now onward. This is my last talk I'm giving to anybody. The 14 people present. One of the persons present later recorded this conversation. And a close friend of his has announced it in a Punjabi satsang, Punjabi discourse that is on available on YouTube. So I knew all these people and met them. They were very old, but I remember. So these people, when they told the story, it showed that when Baba Jamal Singh said, Savan Singh, you will carry on this work that I have been doing. He said, Master, here are 14 people and you can see them. They are more qualified than me. I am a government employee. I work as an engineer in the public works department and I and military public works, so I am busy on the roads and so on. And these people are available to do your work. Why pick on me? Upon which Baba Jamal Singh said, let me check it out. He didn't give a reply himself. This is a very clever way that the masters operate. They want to not only give credit to their own masters, but they want to say their masters are doing everything for them. And they are doing nothing. So he closed his eyes, said, wait, let me check it out. And he closed his eyes. After a few minutes, he opened his eyes. He says, new Moj has come. 
that means a new will has been disclosed. And Baba Savan Singh said, what is the new moj? New moj is that Swamiji, who was his boss, who was his master. Swamiji has said that only Savan Singh will carry on this work. So you have no choice. Sorry. He checked it out. He said, but do you know, you are living in a little hut there. Small little hut on the river bank, bank of the river Bias. I am used to living in a big house. Government provides me that house. And now you want me to leave that big house to do your work and live in a little hut. He said, wait, let me check it out. So he closed his eyes. And after a minute, opened his eyes, said, new moj has come. He said, what is the moj now? Swamiji says, you will not have to move into that little hut. You will live in a house as big or if not bigger than where you are staying now. Are you satisfied? No, no, I have one more question. That is the nature of the great master. One more question. You know that I will be retiring soon from my job on a small pension. And you are saying the number of people will grow to thousands. You had only few people. And now if they grow thousands, how am I going to take care of them? How will I feed them? How will I house them? There's such a large number coming up. He said, wait a minute. And he closed his eyes and opened it. New moj has come. He said, now what is the moj? Moj is Savan saying, you will not have to feed anybody. They will donate enough in food and money to take care of their housing as well as their food. Thank you. Are you now satisfied? One more question. Now you say, Master, that if a person is initiated by a perfect living master, he will not have to come back into the physical world and physical incarnation more than four times, of, including the current time in, in incarnation as a human being in human form, not more than three times more, four times total. Now, I am trying to go back home right now in this life. You are going to put me into duty where the disciples will be coming four times and I have to come again and again four times with them. That's not fair. And Baba Jamal Singh said, hold on, let me check it out. He said, closed his eyes. He opened his eyes. New moj has come. What is the moj now? Now the moj is Savan Singh, whoever you will initiate will not have to come once again even. This will be his last life. So he got all these things done before he started his work. I thought it very clever. I've never heard any master taking on his mentorship like that. When I read the stories in this book, it reminds me of that clever man. Happens to be my master too. His way of dealing with problems was amazing. He went to the root of everything and took care of it. So I was very touched by these stories. And this has come up, I said, I have to share with you. I have to share. Fortunately, you have anything copy here? Or this is the only one? No, Master G, I have uh, uh, If anybody is interested in this. I mean, I know you are not initiates of Baba Savan Singh. And if you have any association with people who do Baba Savan Singh and want to know how he affected them, Stories are very, very interesting. Anybody interested, please? Should he contact you or Bibi Raju? These have been translated by Raj Kumari Rajput. I call her Bibi. Where is, is she here, Bibi? Thia? Where is the Bibi? Please show your face. Okay. Anybody interested can contact her if you want to see. But this has touched me a lot. That's why I brought it out. Masters are human beings like any one of us. No difference. They are born like us. They have the karma like us. They grow up like us. They die like us. No difference in their life. And difference is an attitude. The attitude we have is 
we are troubled in a real world and therefore we suffer and we can't understand why we suffer whose karma we have we have no knowledge of our past life we have no knowledge of what going to happen why this world was created we have thousands of questions but no answers for us they have all the answers therefore they enjoy the show that's been created by consciousness so that's the only difference the attitude changes and that is why they live a very joyful happy life of a witness of his of a spectator of a show all their life so that is why the only difference is the way they look at it and any one of us who can attain that status with their help looks at life the same way and some people wonder how can they be happy 24/7 even when they are sick they are having surgery they are dying going through anything like us and yet they are happy all the time because they realize what's happening is part of a well drafted complete show and that makes a big difference to our attitude towards life some people have asked me you are telling me there is consciousness and there you can go to that source of it so what Our life is still the same. We are human beings. We are still to go through the same struggles up and down. I say no. You will look at life very differently. How much would you give to have twenty-four-seven happiness throughout your life? Whatever it is that you have to buy, you would give everything for that. And that's only a side benefit of following the spiritual path. I had discussions with the professors at Harvard University teaching metaphysics. teaching logic teaching philosophy they said what you are talking of is a great story created by the mind what you are talking of is visions that you can have in meditation the mind can create all those visions by power of suggestion hypnotists do that all the time they give a power of suggestion you begin to think it's real so don't you think you are just what of suggestion you are just auto suggesting things to yourself and say these are real experiences i said you may be absolutely right it may be i am doing some auto suggestion but the fact is whatever i am doing it has led to 24/7 happiness and i am happy all the time you guys are taking prozac and <laughs> depressants <laughs> who is in a better state okay i make up the story it's making me total happiness and does that it has not landed me in a mental asylum i could be talking things which people say is crazy put him inside the hospital or something they could say that but i don't tell them what i am doing i worked in government jobs never told them what my spiritual path was they thought my mind was very sharp that i could do so many things i was never using my mind i never told them so they never locked me up <laughs> i am still free the point is simple that no matter how you look at the spiritual path no matter from which ever point of view you look at it the benefits are so obvious that is worthwhile following from any point of view but if you actually follow then you find that the results you get are so amazing you could not even have expected them you could not have learned about the whole creation you could have never found the answers to questions like why are we here why have been created why the universe been created when was it created how is all this happening you can't get answer to these questions meditation going within answer these questions it's a much vaster experience that comes up through this so i'm very happy to share this information with you because i know you're all seekers seeking the same thing that i'm seeking we are all co-travelers fellow travelers on the same journey and that is why i like to share this not to help you i share this that this is an opportunity that my master gave to me to do service seva to him you might think i'm doing it to you no i'm doing it to him he said do it i'm doing it he told me one day he gave me permission as a child to fan him with a big fan i loved it today he told me instead of take the fan up talk to you about it i'm talking seva is a great opportunity 
if you do seva, service, service to master is the great, greatest thing. But even if you do service to others, what should be true service? If you say, I am doing service to expect a reward, it's not service. If you're expecting a reward, it's a business transaction. Let me say that clearly. Seva done for some reward is not considered seva in the real sense because it's just putting an investment in something to expect a return on that. That business. Seva is that you're offering something, surrendering something without expecting anything. If you do seva like that, it's as good as meditation, I can tell you. Seva is very important. It doesn't matter what seva it is. You can do seva of any kind. It doesn't matter. It should be done without expecting a reward with the maximum of love and devotion you can put into it. Somebody asked me, do you really have a shortcut to this difficult meditation and all that? I said, yes, this is the shortcut. Do seva without regard to the, what you get for it. Don't think of it that. And do it with the maximum love and devotion you can put into it. It will be as good as meditation. And you get the same benefits. Because meditation will speed up so fast. You will go within so fast. Just because you are doing that. Why? How can that happen? The reason is very simple. When you do seva without expecting a reward, you are controlling your mind. And meditation is a more difficult way to control your mind than the ability to do something without expecting a reward. According to Lord Krishna, who is worshipped as avatar of Vishnu in India, in talking to Arjun, he says, if you can, can do a karma, an action, without bothering about the fruit thereof, you can become a yogi. You can have union with the truth. So he is talking of something we, when we link it with what we are getting back, we lose the benefit of that. So if we have that power to control our mind to that extent that we don't think of what happens, we've done our job. And by the way, I was uh, sitting with some friends when I was very young and I said, let's practice something. I said, let's practice performing our actions every day without thinking what they will lead to. And when we did, we were so much happier because what was causing problem was that when we act, we expect something. The expectation was killing us, not the action. And expectations are what kill us because if they are not fulfilled, they are disappointed. When you are disappointed, our whole energy at doing things goes away. So expectations come in the way of our growth. And that is why when we say seva without expectation, it works beautifully in controlling your mind. And that's how it works. And we are very happy to share these things with you. And I believe uh, Jonathan told me there are a few questions. So I'll take up a few of them. This question comes from Joey, age 10. <clears throat> how do I know that God is real? And how do I know that I am not the only soul around and that I am not imagining everything else around me? How do I know that God is real? How do I know that I am not the only soul around and that I am not doing anything else around me and that there is nothing around me? Simple. You know the other people around us. We don't see God. So we don't know God is there or not. Only that person can say he has seen God who is actually seen. We do hear how to see him. And if we do what is required to do, do to see God, we'll see God. If we want to see God, first we have to find out where is God. If we are looking outside in the sky, looking outside in the temples, in the mosques, in the uh, uh, churches, in the house of worship, in the synagogues, if we are looking outside, we don't find God. I have never seen him there. I have been to all of them. And I never saw God. I see people worshipping with their hands folded, looking up. I looked at the sky also. I didn't see him. So we can't see God because we don't know where he is. But we hear from people who have seen God. And they say, you can also see God. 
but he is not outside anywhere. He is inside you. So when they said inside, then I said, how do we see inside? Because my eyes don't look inside. When I close my eyes, I can't see anything. Because my eyes are trying to see something and I close my eyes, then I can't see anything. So how will I see inside? So then I found that when I imagine something, I am imagining, now right now I am imagining, I am flying a kite. And the kite is flying in the sky. There is no kite here, how am I seeing it? I am seeing a kite and I there is no kite. And if I close my eyes, I still see the kite. If I open my eyes, I still see the kite. Which eyes are seeing that? Not these eyes. So I close my eyes and I see the same eyes which are seeing the kite. Maybe they can see God. So I close my eyes and I look with that and whatever I see, I find I can see something that looks like God. Then I find, what if I close my eyes there also? These eyes I have closed. But the eyes with which I was seeing the kite flying, can I close those also? When I close those, I can see God. So there is a way to see God. Then only you can say, there is a God, not before that. You can't say there is God before that till you have seen. Then nothing is there unless you have seen. Are you the only soul? No, there are so many souls all around us. When will you find out you are the only soul? When you wake up. More than ordinary wake up. When we go to sleep and in the dream we see 20 people, we say which one is dreaming? All 20 look the same. I also look like them. They also look like me. They are all 20. When I wake up, I find only one me was dreaming. They were created by that. If we can do that, if we can open our eyes like that, wake up, we'll find all the others we saw were souls created in the dream and we were the only one. But till you do that, you can't say there's only one soul. When that happens, then you can say there's only one soul. He is listening to the bells inside the inner melody, a mechanical part of meditation. If so, how can it be made into love and devotion? He is listening to the bells inside the inner melody, a mechanical part of meditation. If so, how can it be made into love and devotion? When we withdraw our attention behind the eyes, in order to listen to what's going on there, we notice that we are talking inside. So we listen to our thoughts. We have been doing it all our life. It's not that we are not listeners. We are 24-7 constant listeners. Nobody has ever stopped listening, whether you meditate or not. We are constantly listening. Most of the time we are listening to our own thoughts. Whatever those thoughts are, our attention goes there. When we listen to a thought about something, it's generally outside of ourselves. And that is why the thought takes our attention outside. Almost all the time, our attention is outside because we think about outside things. We don't think what is happening inside. So first thing is that we are automatic listeners. And we are listening to things which are taking us outside because we are listening to our thoughts. Is there anything else we can listen to besides our thoughts? We can. It requires two things. One, how to stop listening to the thoughts. Secondly, then finding out if there is anything else to listen to. If you can't do the first part, you can't do the second. How to stop listening to the thoughts is what we do by chanting or repeating a mantra. When we repeat Simran mantra, words given by somebody outside, not our own thoughts, somebody else's has given us word to repeat and keep on repeating, we begin to listen to those words and thoughts take a second place. So 
listening to artificial words put into the thought stream prevents us. And what do the words do? Let me repeat. The words raise a curiosity. Okay, I'm repeating words. What do they mean? The other word we knew, thought we knew, was taking that outside. What do they mean? They mean nothing. Or they mean something, we don't know what they mean. So our attention begins to go to who is listening, rather than what we are listening to through the thoughts. When it happens, who is listening, other sounds can be heard which are not words and not thoughts. What are those other sounds? The musical sounds. Sounds like a truck passing outside, sounds like drums beating, sounds like thunder. So a lot of sounds can be heard if you are not listening to th thoughts. They go back to listen to thoughts, the th sound disappear. Because it depends where your attention is. If your attention is on listening to thoughts, your mind will go out. If your attention is not to listen to it, not do anything else, not to listen to them by a device of repeating words which have no recollection of the outside, then you have to no choice but to listen to something else. So these sounds start coming in. Sounds come right, left, above, below, center. We don't know what those sounds are. Maybe those sounds are many of them. We can even hear our own breathing. We can hear heartbeat sometimes and we concentrate a lot listening to sounds. So many physical sounds we can hear. Then we find if we are trying to listen attentively. Now that's the key. Remember, this is the key. If you want to listen attentively, then the attention goes to the listener, not to the thought. That's the whole secret. The secret is not to give attention to what you are listening to, but yourself listening. When that happens, more attention is who is listening to these outside sounds. A sound emerges, which is different from the other sounds. That's what we are calling it resembles a bell sound. It is not a sound coming from anywhere outside except from the self. Therefore, when you are putting attention on a sound emanating from the self, it's radiating from your own self, inside. Not from the body, not from this sense system, not from any organ at all. Is emanating from your conscious, wakeful self. And it resembles the bell. It's not exactly like a bell, it resembles the bell. When you hear that and you concentrate on that, what are you concentrating on? You're concentrating on the self. When you concentrate on the self, automatically the nature of the self awakens more than it is now. And the nature of the self is to have love, beauty, joy, automatically. This is not the nature of the mind nature of the self. Automatically, when you listen to this sound, and then you associate it not with any other thought, except the thought, your master who loves you so much, he gave that method to do it, you automatically associate with the master, your love and devotion for the master develops. These bell sounds, the other small bell sounds come up, they are not the same, they are like other sounds. The sound that is sounding like a bell, which can sometimes be very long peal of a bell. Some people confuse it. Some people say maybe it's a whistle from ourselves. Sometimes a long peal. So that comes from within the self. And that's the whole purpose. The purpose of listening to this sound is that the sound can withdraw your attention to your own self. The secret of enlightenment is to discover yourself. And that's why the sound works. Does a soul who is not marked also feel the love of a PLM? Does a soul who is not marked also feel the love of a PLM? Generally, yes. Because the connection we have with people, PLM means perfect living master, that means a human being who has attained the level of consciousness of actually realizing the self and is able to communicate with us and able to convey to us. Conveying is in many ways. Sometimes we convey by words. We talk. We are talking to each other now. We talk to our friends. This is a way of conveying uh, our 
information, knowledge, data, whatever we want to convey. We can use words, we can use telephones, we can use text messages, we can use uh, printers, we can use Morse codes, we can use any method to communicate. Then you can also communicate telepathically. Sometimes we have very surprised somebody comes, I was thinking of you, so was I. You didn't arrange it. It happened. Why couldn't you arrange it? You couldn't arrange it because you don't know where it's happening. You don't know how it happened. If you knew, you could arrange it. Telepathic communication is a communication through sense perceptions without the use of the bodily organs. Very simple. That a thought comes into your head. It's interpreted in your language, in your head, not spoken in the body, with the mouth. A thought comes into your head and it's communicated. You connect it with some person, that thought, and that person feels it. This is telepathic communication. And by the way, at the astral plane, there's a normal way of communicating. This is physical plane is different. And we are actually accidentally using that astral communication and having accidental telepathic communications. Some people develop it also, but if you have experience of going to the astral plane, you will communicate telepathically. There's a great beauty in telepathic communication. Telepathic communication does not convey your words, not the spoken words. Telepathic communication conveys the meaning of those words. You can have a thought Put into your language, transmit to somebody who doesn't know your language, can still know the thought in the other language. I've seen that. People having no knowledge of German have experienced communication with their friends in Germany who don't know any English just because of telepathic thought. The highest level of communication that takes place between human beings in the physical plane is through the communication of love. When you love somebody, something happens. It happens mutually. We are communicating. No words, not even thought, but some strange feeling inside which you can't explain. Why are you so pulled by somebody? What is attracting you to somebody? How is it happening? That communication is spiritual. It's not mental, nor sensory, nor physical. When there is a perfect living master around us, He's perfect living master in the title to take care of the number of people because time in the body is limited. Time and space where that person can work is limited. But the others can also feel the spiritual language. And that is why even people who are not marked to be the disciples of that perfect living master also feel it. So it can be felt by anybody. And more sensitive you are, the more you can feel it. Sensitive means you are not totally engrossed in communicating with other means. If you are totally engrossed in talking all the time about worldly things, you don't feel it. But if you are a seeker, but not yet a marked seeker of that particular perfect living master, you can feel the love of that master and touches you and something happens to you that there is something going on here, you can't explain what it is. But if such a thing happens to any individual in the presence of a perfect living master, it's guaranteed that person will be marked for another perfect living master. There's no question about it. This feeling from the soul, the spiritual feeling does not come unless you are a seeker of that level or a spiritual seeker or a mental seeker or a physical seeker. And that men, spiritual seekers get that feeling and they do get uh, initiated by a perfect living master. But many of those who say we are not marked, they don't know whether they're marked or not. And I'll tell you something which may little surprise you. Perfect living masters have a strange state of awareness. Their awareness is total. It's very difficult to explain what is total awareness. That means they are aware of all the realities, aware of all the illusions. They are aware of the whole process of creation, 
even when they are sitting as physical human beings. What, what would, be, how would they be looking at? Supposing a person has that and sits amongst us, how will that person look at us? What, what does he see? He sees part of, we are all part of, are we all part of himself? Are we part of just one that he's in? What is it? It's very difficult to explain. But when we say we are a marked soul or not, we are taking it as if it is in a time frame. Marked soul is not a mental phenomenon and therefore it's not in a time frame. It is beyond time. If it is beyond time, to say a perfect living master comes for marked souls is as good as saying a perfect living master who looks at a person marks it to be a marked soul. There is no difference. Because operating from something we know before or after. It's very difficult to explain how a perfect living master is looking at a world in which we are all looking like the real. And he knows it's real and unreal at the same time. And he has the secret of perfect living master knows who is marked. So it's well said that it's not that you are marked souls for which a perfect living master comes. He comes for souls and marks them and picks them up. There is no difference between the two things because he operates from that level. So it's, it's, it's not easy to understand, but I can tell you that it's a great opportunity for anybody marked and marked. We don't know anything about it. It's just a word statement. But to be in the presence of a perfect living master is a great opportunity. And if you are seeking with that love and devotion, you are marked right there. No question. One more question. This one has to do with PLMs having complete awareness. It must be hard for a PLM to watch a suspense movie because he already knows the end and there is no more thrill left. <laughs> It must be hard for a PLM to watch suspense movies because he already knows the end and there is no more thrill left. <clears throat> if a PLM was only a witness of his suspense movies and knows the end, he kills the suspense. Sorry. But if he's making the movie and making the movie in which there can be several suspense ends, and he doesn't tell himself which suspense ends he's going to pick up. He's still enjoying the show. He's the maker of the suspense, not the viewer of the suspense. We are the viewers of the suspense, not a PLM. Thank you very much for the time you spent with me. And I'll be uh, seeing a few people who have asked for personal time. And then we'll meet again next month. Thank you very much.